So one of the things you're required to know in the CCNA is the three-layer hierarchical model or the three-tier architecture. And the layers are the access layer, the distribution layer, and the core layer. So at the access layer is where our end devices connect to the network. So you can see here the PCs connecting the network, and they could be printers or phones, you name it. But this is the access layer where we access the network. You also have access layer switches, which we call workgroup switches at the access layer. So here we go, access layer, we've got our workgroup switches and our end devices connect into the access layer. Then at the distribution layer, we have multi-layer switches here, which is the layer where we implement essentially routing. It's also the layer where policy-based connectivity is implemented. So rules, firewall rules, ACLs, things like that. So those are implemented at the distribution layer. It's the layer of routing. And then the core layer. The core layer also has these multi-layer switches, but these are our backbone switches. These are multi-layer switches that are specialized for high-speed connections. They have big bandwidth or big pipes for moving data fast. They're not gonna be laying down a lot of policy or making a lot of decisions. They're just going to be forwarding packets. The distribution layer is where we have our policies being enforced. So that's the access, distribution, and core, the three-layer hierarchical model. Now, if you can't afford all of these network devices, you will see, and it's taught in the curriculum, about a collapsed core, where the collapsed core is the core layer and the distribution layer collapsed into one layer. And you can see here, you could do that with these multi-layer three switches handing, handling the routing and the policy-based connectivity, and then at the access layer, you have your workgroup switches and your PCs. All right, let's move on. Another topic that you need to know is about topologies. You're expected to know LAN topologies, like a star topology with a switch in the center, an extended star, which is two stars connected together. You can see here the switch in the center and the devices connect into the center, and then a bus topology, which was originally created with a coax cable where you would tap into the coax cable and um, all devices were on the bus and all the data would travel along the bus and every device would see the data. Packets were seen by everything, by everyone. Um, also, you could say a logical bus topology could be a topology which uses a hub. Since a hub regenerates and sends packets out of all ports, every device sees it much like a bus. All right, you need to know a little bit about WAN topologies. So WAN topologies are different. You've got point-to-point -to -point topologies. This would be like in a T1 connection or a least line connection. And this point-to-point -point is usually not a physical point-to-point -point connecting one device to another. There's usually a service provider network that this is going through. So it's a virtual point-to-point -point network. Hub and spoke, the communication goes from the spokes to the hub and then out to the other spokes. And once again, internet service provider is uh, provides you with this kind of WAN topology. And a mesh or full mesh network, which characterizes that, is where every device connects to every other device. You know, you're not going to implement this on a LAN per se, but you could see this implemented on a WAN service provider type network. All right, let's look at more physical layer stuff. So layer one stuff like the media or network cabling. So three, you need to know the basics about cabling. So you've got your, your copper cable here, your ethernet copper cable, and you have fiber optic cables, and you have wireless or radio waves. So with copper cable, it's usually called a unshielded UTP, unshielded twisted pair cable. It's inexpensive. Ethernet cables are inexpensive. They're easy to install. They use twisted pairs. There's four pairs of wires in the cable and they're twisted. Uh, each two wires are twisted together. So there's four twisted pairs. Today's standard uses CAT6 cables with RJ45 ends. And the RJ45 ends on a CAT6 cable are uh, specialized. It's a little higher quality. Previous standard was CAT5 and CAT5E. And CAT6 is just an enhanced version, essentially, of the CAT5E. Now, the wiring on the RJ45Ns uses the TIA 568A and 568B standard, which we'll look at in a second. 
To protect against electromagnetic interference, we use a process called cancellation, which is provided by the twists in the wire pairs. Now the cabling can be run for 100 meters before the signal needs to be regenerated at a switch. And the typical uh, cable run, the farthest that it can go, is 90 meters if you take into account the cable that goes from the wall to the computer and also the cable that connects from uh, the switch to a patch panel. Horizontal cabling. So wired copper, unshielded twisted pair ethernet cables are used in horizontal cabling, meaning from the networking closet, from the switch, to the computers or printers or end devices. That's horizontal cabling. I've already talked about electromagnetic interference, which can be caused by running the cables across fluorescent lighting or through um, certain types of machinery, things like that. And today's standard is to have switches with one gigabit per second switch ports. And so you could run one gigabit per second over copper cable to your devices. Now in the curriculum it says you can do more, you can do 10 gigabit on copper, but that's not, I'd say that's not typical, or at least I don't see that every day. What about fiber optic cables? Well fiber optic cables are expensive, they're more expensive than copper cables, and uh, they require careful installation because you can't bend the fiber optic cables, you could break the glass, so you can't pinch the cables. They use, for the light source, the light that goes through the cable, they use uh, lasers if it's a single mode fiber and LEDs if it's multi-mode fiber. The types of connectors are like ST or SC connectors. There's also many other types of connectors. The glass core in the cable is 50 microns if it's a single mode fiber or 65 microns, a little bit bigger, if it's multi-mode fiber. The cables have multi-layer protection in them. They have uh, the sheath around the glass core. There's multiple layers to protect against light leakage. They can run a lot farther than copper cables. So they don't suffer from attenuation like a copper cable where the source, the, in a copper cable we've got voltage that are signaling the ones and zeros, but in fiber optic we have light pulses that signal the ones and zeros, and those light pulses can go a lot farther. So you can have runs that go kilometers distance. Um, maximum, well, is less than 100 kilometers that you could run single mode fiber laser without the light getting too weak where it won't properly signal the ones and zeros. Now, fiber optic cables are used with vertical cabling. So they don't, you don't use fiber optic cables to run from the switch to the computer, but maybe from a switch to another switch, or from networking closet to networking closet, or from the first floor of a building to the second floor of the building, or from building to building. So vertical cabling is used with fiber optics. Typically it's 10 gigabits per second. It does not suffer from electromagnetic interference like copper because it's not using voltage, it's using light. All right, now what about wireless? It's also inexpensive. There's no installation, you don't have to run cables. It uses multiple in, multiple out, multiple antennas. The current standards are 802.11n, AC and AD. For security authentication, the current standard is WPA2 for uh, personal networks or home networks, and WPA2 Enterprise, which would be used for companies that have separate authentication servers like a RADIUS server. So with WPA2, the Enterprise, you need a RADIUS server or TACAX Plus server. Now, this type of authentication uses a pre-shared key and there's encryption involved. So WPA2 can be configured to use AES encryption to um, protect the data, to protect the communication. It can go, the, the signal, the wireless signal can travel about 230 feet without uh, serious degradation and that's with the N standard and the AC standard. There's no cabling, however, the wireless access points or wireless router uh, may need to have a cabling to connect to the network at some point. A single cable from the wireless router to connect into the network is not what we're talking about here. It does suffer from radio frequency interference. So interference that could be caused, that can block radio waves, could um, disrupt the signal. The speeds for the wireless today can go up to 1.3 gigabits per second for uh, the 802.11 AC standard. 
So this is the wiring on the RJ45Ns and you're still required to know it for your CCNA. So the T568A standard and the B standard. And the way we learn this is on the A standard, it starts with white, green, green and pair three. This is on the left side of the RJ45. So white, green, green, and then white, orange, and then the blue pair is in the middle, pair one, which is a little weird. And then you have the other orange, and then white, brown, and brown. And the way to think about this is 568A starts white, green, green. It always goes stripe solid, stripe solid, stripe solid. And then in the 568B standard, on the left side, you'll see the orange starts with white, orange, orange, and then white, green. Now, to make a crossover cable. Now, you're only gonna need a crossover cable with older equipment that can only run in half duplex mode. So like 100 megabit ethernet um, older switches or 10 megabit uh, types of switches. So really old devices that can only go half duplex. You may need a crossover cable to connect from switch to switch or router to router or things like that. And a crossover cable you could get a crossover cable by putting one end of the cable and wiring it to the 568A standard and the other end of the cable to the 568B standard. So now when you do that, you have one and three crossing and two and six. So one and notice white green on one end of the cable. Well, white green on the other end of the cable will be at three. So now one and three are crossing. And then the orange, so if the orange is on this side on, on this one, it'll be uh, three on this one. So they've now crossed. And then two and six, green here in the two position on the other end of the cable, it would be in the six position. So crossover cable, just remember one and three and two and six cross. And you just put the 568B standard wired on one end of the cable and then the A standard on the other end of the cable. And that's a crossover cable. For a straight through cable, you choose either standard and you wire that standard on both ends of the cable. So let's say I have a C Ethernet cable here and I look at the ends, it's typically either gonna be like this with white orange on the left on both ends or it'll be like this and have white green on the left on both ends of the cable and that's a straight through Ethernet cable. That's what we use today, straight through Ethernet cables. With gigabit Ethernet, all four pairs of wires send data. In the older um, fast ethernet, 100 megabit per second, half duplex, only pair three did the transmitting and pair two did the receiving. So only two pairs send and receive, but with gigabit ethernet, all four pairs of wires send data. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide here is about network cabling uh, troubleshooting. So what are the troubleshooting issues that you can have with cabling? Well, there's a bunch. So you have uh, TX, RX, reverse. If older equipment, if there's no auto crossing, like I said, with um, older equipment, you're gonna maybe need a crossover cable. So one problem that you could have is you have older equipment, you need a crossover cable because you're connecting from switch to switch. You could have a short where the wires are incorrectly connected to wrong pins on either side of the cable, creating a short. You could have an open where when you were crimping the cable, the wires were not pushed all the way far enough into the RJ45 terminators to touch the connectors, to touch the little brass connectors. You could have uh, the issue of a split pair with incorrectly terminated send and receive pairs registered as split pairs. You could have bad connections caused by just bad cable termination. In other words, you did it yourself and you didn't do it well. A crosstalk where the ones and zeros can jump from one pair of wires to the other. Next, which is near end crosstalk, fext is far end crosstalk, typically caused by electromagnetic interference and low quality cable. Attenuation is where the signal, the, the voltage, gets weak. So signal attenuation failure caused by cable runs that are too long. You could have made your cable longer than 100 meters and all of a sudden you're not registering the ones and zeros at the end of the cable uh, at the NIC well. And then cable placement. If you put the cables near places of high electromagnetic interference, you're going to have problems. So those are some troubleshooting um, scenarios with um, copper cabling anyway.